So this new chapter deals with reacting mixtures and combustion. Um, the first part of it, I think, is a very good review, just how to handle reaction equations. Uh, then we'll get into conservation of energy, the first law for a reacting system. So now you, this really throws students for a loop because it's not all just water stays water. It's all not just ammonia stays ammonia. It's not, not all just something that stays something. You have some hydrocarbon turning into carbon dioxide and water. You can still do a first law. It just makes you think about the datum point the be, where all these energies, uh, enthalpies, internal energies are measured for uh, different constituents, different uh, molecules, O2, CO2, H2O, where they are measured from, so a common datum point. A very common problem is considering the adiabatic flame temperature. Different fuels burn hotter. Some of them don't. They have different adiabatic flame temperatures. And if you burn a fuel, a hydrocarbon fuel, let's say propane, acetylene burns hotter. If you bro burn propane with pure oxygen, its adiabatic flame temperature is higher than if you burn it with just air. Likewise, oxygen in acetylene gets a very high adiabatic flame temperature, and that's why they use it to cut metal. Um, so take a look at adiabatic flame temperature for burning fuels. And then if you've got the first law, how about the second law? But when you deal with the second law, you have to deal with entropy, and you have to get now it on a common reference plane, so absolute entropy. And then a law associated with absolute entropy is this concept of a third law of thermodynamics. Now this is interesting. You're already familiar with the second law and the first law and the zeroth law. You probably forgot the zeroth law. The zeroth law didn't come first, it probably came last, but they thought it was so fundamental it should have a lower number than the first or the second, so they stuck it and called it the zeroth law. But the third law, well, it's the third law is there, and we'll talk about the third law of thermodynamics. So there you go. There's four laws of thermodynamics that coming out of this class you should be knowledgeable of. Combustion. Well, when we deal with combustion, often it is complete, meaning that uh, they use a one-way arrow in the reaction equation. You start off with some reactants, and after the combustion process is done, no more reactants are left. It's all products. Later, we'll start with the right-hand side, left-hand side, and there'll be an equilibrium. But right now, when you discuss combustion, it's one way and it's complete, typically. That's the way we deal with it. Uh, what reacts? Well, we have fuel and oxidizer. So a hydrocarbon fuel, some CH with some number, number here, so many carbon, hydrogen in that fuel. And then you have something where oxygen is there to combust. Some oxidizer. Oxygen is the preferred oxidizer. Okay? And then you go to products. Now, this is always what's interesting. How does a brand new student who's never studied chemistry, never studied combustion, know what products to expect when you burn methane or gasoline or diesel fuel, dodecane or propane or acetylene? How do they know? You have to be told, or you just have to go and look at a good resource and know that the products when you burn a hydrocarbon are carbon dioxide. That's the preferred product. That's what we want. And water vapor. <coughs> so the carbon that's here goes to carbon dioxide. The hydrogen that's in the fuel goes to water vapor. First time you study this, you say, why doesn't it go to COH or CO or you know some C2HO or some other molecule? Because these are the most basic, fundamental lowest energy states, you get the most heat release out, they're the most stable. CO2 and water are very, very stable. Okay? Um, it's like this H2 plus one half O2 goes to H2O. This is a fuel. Hydrogen is a good fuel. <laughs> so it, it's not that something like it would be better if, if all the hydrogen just went to H2. It would not be better. It, it goes to H2O. 
But that's a question that really is more for uh, maybe a chemistry professor or somebody. Why? Why is this? All I'm telling you is that's the lowest energy. Okay? And so that's our preferred products out of combustion. If you get some carbon monoxide, first of all, that's the asphyxiant, which will kill you, right? You don't want to breathe carbon monoxide. Carbon dioxide's fine. But this is an asphyxiant, which will kill you. But that fuel could be burned to get more heat release. So CO is not a good product. Okay. Now, we also have in our reaction equation, with this as an equal sign or quasi-equal sign, it's, a one, you know, it's the arrow saying, hey, we have reactants going to products. We have stoichiometric coefficients. These are those numbers that go in front of each of those entries. True? So uh, when we balance the equation, we, we fix those coefficients in our reaction equation. We'll solve some examples. But where do we get the... Where do we get the oxidizer? Where do we get the O2 from? Well, the one source is, and it's very expensive, pure O2. And if you're rich, you can get bottles of pure O2, and away you go. If you're NASA and you want to launch a rocket, you have hydrogen and pure oxygen. You blend it, and you, you have a tremendous thrust, and it comes out very hot. And so pure O2 is, is, is the preferred oxi oxidizer in there. Uh, but uh, when you have an engine, a bus or a car, a lawnmower engine, a gas turbine, you're burning methane, you get the oxygen from air. And so when you get the oxygen from air, air is primarily made up of nitrogen, true? Now, what for, for dry air considerations, we'll just say that it's 21% oxygen and 79% Nitrogen, that's our standard dry air. Okay. Now, uh, uh, so this is the right proportion of oxygen and nitrogen. Okay. If I take this equation and I multiply by 1 over 0.21, that gives me a new equation, which is 1O2 plus 3.76N2. This equation is easy to read. It says if I have one kilomole of air, I'll have 0.21 kilomoles of oxygen and 0.79 kilomoles of nitrogen. This equation is equally easy to read. It says if I have 4.76 kilomoles of dry air, in that 4.76 kilomoles of dry air, I'll have one kilomole of oxygen and 3.76 kilomoles of nitrogen. It's the same proportion. True? Why do we prefer this? Because it's a 1 in front of that O2. So another way to think of it, to get 1 kilomole of oxygen into the engine to combust with the hydrocarbon fuel, I need to bring along for a free ride 3.76 kilomoles of nitrogen. If there's some heat release in the combustion, the energy that's translated into internal energy from chemical energy is going to make the products of combustion spanking hot, right? That energy release will have to heat up both the water vapor, the CO2, as well as the nitrogen. And so when you're bringing nitrogen along for the ride, when you're just looking forward, we do energy analysis, you can see why the, the temperature is going to be lower. All that nitrogen is going to have to be heated up. There's a lot of nitrogen that goes along for the ride. Okay. So, so how many kilomoles of nitrogen per kilomole of uh, O2 in dry air? 3.76 kilomoles of nitrogen per kilomole of oxygen in dry air. In order to get one kilomole of oxygen from dry air, how many kilomoles of nitrogen are brought along? And to get one kilomole of oxygen, how many kilomoles of dry air are brought along? Think about these numbers. Even It doesn't matter what I say during lectures. I'll have a problem. It'll test the students on this concept, and on the final exam, I have to grade it, and I'm, I'm often disappointed how many students miss this concept. They miss this concept. 
If you're going to get oxygen out of the air, it's not pure oxygen you're going to be ingesting into the engine. You're going to be ingesting a lot of nitrogen. That's the right proportion. Theoretical air. What we do is we have some hydrocarbon fuel, and then we bring in just the right amount, 100% theoretical air is the perfect amount of oxygen such that all of the O2 is used up, and it goes into CO2 and H2O. So all of the O2 goes to CO2 and H2O. See, that's where the oxygen goes. It goes here and here. And there's no oxygen that just comes out after combustion by itself. That's 100% theoretical air. If you have 120% theoretical air, you have too much air coming in. You have too much oxygen coming in. You're going to have some excess oxygen going out in the products. It's, it's, there's not enough carbon and hydrogen to match up. So you'll have excess air. What happens if you had 80% theoretical air? Well, you'd have deficient. It'd be 20% deficient. So you see this terminology. It makes sense. It, I hope it makes sense. It's not that hard to understand. So 120% theoretical air is 20% excess air. And 80% theoretical air is 20% deficient air. It's deficient, not enough. There's also the concept of rich and lean. Well, if your engine is running rich, you have too much fuel. And if it's running lean, it's too much air or not enough fuel. So you need more fuel. How about this? Write that out. If it's running lean, you could, you, you could use more fuel. Uh, fuel. A lot of times it's beneficial to run lean versus rich. If you're running rich, you're throwing a lot of expensive hydrocarbons out the tailpipe. If you're running lean, then guess what? Usually your high temperature is lower, you have less NOx emission, it's usually good as long as it's running. But you're getting complete combustion. You're getting complete heat release. All right. So, all right. The other measure that we want to talk about is air to fuel ratio. So you could do it on a mass basis or on a molar basis. So air to fuel on a mass basis will be the mass of air divided by the mass of fuel. And on a molar basis, you put an overbar, air to fuel with an overbar, the number of moles of air to the number of moles of fuel. So those are two air to fuel ratios. Now, guess what? They have fuel to air ratio. It's, a, it's the reciprocal. The fuel to air ratio on a mass basis is the reciprocal of the fuel to air ratio. And on a molar basis, the fuel to air ratio is the reciprocal of the air to fuel ratio. All right. Um, how do you go back and forth? Well, the mass of air is the number of moles of air times the molar mass of air. True? And the mass of fuel is the number of moles of fuel times the molar mass of fuel. And so the molar mass of air is 28.97 kilograms per kilomole. And whatever the fuel you're burning, could be methane, real light, 16. It could be a big, heavy hydrocarbon, have a large, high value for the molar mass of the fuel.